Um, for starters, let me just say that um, last year at Huastepec, I had no idea that the day after I left Huastepec and went to Java 1, that Jonathan Schwartz and Rich Green would announce that Java was about to be open source. In fact, 99% of Center employees were caught completely by surprise by that. But we were very excited about it at the same time. And then that started several, uh, several weeks and actually months of debating about how to open source Java and what license to choose, which ultimately would lead to our early launch on November 13th, in which we announced that the license for Java was the GPL. And we released the uh, first parts of the code, the Java Hotspot Virtual Machine, the Java C compiler, um, and uh, Java Help and some other pieces, and uh, had a broad roadmap for uh, open sourcing the rest of the platform. And then um, throughout the beginning of the year, we had a chance to uh, talk with uh, many people in the community at, uh, at FOSTEN, and then again at Feastlay. And then at Java 1 this year, which was in May, we did the full launch of open source Java and released the remaining parts of the code for which we had copyright and could release the code. Um, and so now that, that gives you sort of a brief history of open source Java. And with that, let me turn it over to Simon to say a few words. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Um, so, hi, I'm Simon Phipps, and I've been the bar's close. <laughs> Stand over here and serve up what I can. Um, so I hope you imagine these slides that I've got here. They're great, but hey, okay, doesn't matter too much. Um, so I joined Sun in 2000. I was hired out of IBM where I just spent five years introducing Java into IBM. Uh, I was part of the team there that introduced Java into the company. And, um, so I, I had an outsider's perspective on Java for a considerable time. I was hired into the company by the then um, uh, the executive vice president of software, who said to me, look, you know, uh, I'm hiring you so you can get Java open source so in 2000. Um, so uh, you could consider me an extreme underperformer. <laughs> it took me until 2007 to get it completed. Um, uh, the, the, the deal that I've had with Java for a while is to look upon what's going on with what has gone on with the Java platform as uh, one of the many parallel processes in free software. Um, the, 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 if you look at the, the history of the broader free software movement, there's been lots of parallel activities. That, I mean, they'll, they'll branch off. Uh, some of them do actually happen in parallel with each other. The, the use of BSD and the way that it was licensed in, in, uh, at the beginning of the 80s was actually completely independent of what Richard Stallman was doing over largely because of Emacs. Um, and those two things were both encapsulating the spirit of their age. Uh, it turned out, turned out that the Sun was, pre was party to the BSD side of things. It was very much a party to the view that um, things work best when everyone can get at the code. And it's best if you don't mess too much with the rules to how they touch things. And as time went on, it, it, inside Sun, that, that BSD kind of spirit was, has been a very strong thread in the company. And the way that Java was set up in 1995 was as close as the people who were involved could make it to a BSD spirit, um, except they were in a market context where there was an extremely hostile uh, and dangerous monopolist who had a known practice of finding key technologies and embracing and extending them in the marketplace and using their market power to snuff things out before they could get going. And so Java was set up with all the source code available and with a very liberal set of rules about what you could do with the source code, but with a license that was carefully crafted to make sure that it couldn't be embraced and extended. With, you know, it's a completely open camp with bear traps all around, all around the outside. And um, that was all happening in a context that was well clear of the commercial popularity of free software, uh, I think in the GPL and FSF sense of free software. That really rose to uh, a summit at the end of the 90s as um, Mozilla proved you could actually take a piece of code and that the world didn't end when you licensed it under free licenses. Um, now, some screwed up at the end of the 90s because um, we, uh, actually, it was a, there was a mutual cock-up, but we can discuss that later. 
uh, we didn't keep track of where the free software communities were going with Java because we were too busy dealing with the success of Java. You know, the, uh, we, we had um, loads of companies coming and asking for, for licenses to the Java technology. It, it had succeeded beyond their wildest dreams. And we really didn't have the scope to go fix the licenses. It was kind of priority 12 or 14 or something down the priority list. There was no actual hostility to free software. There was just the sense that it was something that we didn't have time to deal with because there were really very few people employed by the company to deal with it. And there were lots of very big corporations pressing in. Um, now, my feeling is that in, a, in an ideal world, it would have been free software a lot sooner. Uh, I ideally would have to say, become free software in 2003. I think that was the earliest point that it would have been feasible. Uh, as it turned out, uh, it got debated inside the sun every year, just before the so one. Have like and each year, it, um, yeah. uh, each year it would be discussed, considered, and would nearly make it into the analysis for Java 1 until somebody at the last minute would say, no, you can't do that because... And we finally got to uh, 2006, <coughs> and the context changed. And uh, lots of people went into Java 1 2006, assuming the debate had happened, and that the story was over, and that it wasn't going to be free software. And then to everyone's immense surprise, our chief executive announced that it was going to be free software under the GPL as part of his keynote address, and set the line for what was going to happen. And so in the last year, uh, the Java team has been very hurriedly working out exactly how to do what they were told. Uh, the, the, the essence of this is that Sun genuinely wants the source code that it's worked on for the Java platform to be free software under the GPL, and has told everyone to go do it. And as frequently happens as things go free software inside Sun, the group that had been vigorously opposing it before suddenly become the chief advocates for it. It worked that way with Solaris. The, all the pushback that there was about uh, uh, making Solaris into free software suddenly turned into advocacy once we passed the, passed the goal, passed the finishing line. And the same thing has happened with Java. We've now got people vigorously advocating free Java, and uh, with Tom as the chief cheerleader here. So, as Tom just described, the state that we're in at the moment, the Java platform consists of um, a, a core piece of Java, Java SE, which is the, the Java runtime. And then there are two other, what used to be called profiles of Java. There's mobile, Java Mobile and Java Enterprise. All three of those have Sun's implementations of the standards available under the GPL v2. And where it's smart to do so, we've added the class path exception to the GPL v2 so that we're exactly mirroring the great stuff that people like um, Dalibor and Mark did uh, with class path. Um, it turns out that, so we've got all of, all of Java EE We've got uh, all of Java, all the code that we wrote for Java ME released. With Java SE, the Java runtime, it turns out we bought code from a bunch of people uh, down the road and um, they didn't give us sufficient rights to make the code open source. And um, about 4% of the code of Java SE is under, uh, we, are, we have got the terms that we are subject to don't allow us to place it under a free software license. And so that work is now um, uh, the, uh, available with binary lumps, and we've put the Java SE code under GPL with an exception that allows it to be combined with temporarily with these binary lumps, while we and others get on with the work of reverse engineering the code that is in the binary lumps and making those free software as well. Um, so the, um, Tom can comment on the time scale for the, um, for the, the, the binary lumps. Uh, and we're, I'd also like you to hear from some of the people who've been working on the binary, or at least have got visibility of the work on the binary lumps, and that's why there's people like Dalibor here, and also Andrew, wherever Andrew is, over there. Well, let, yeah, let me, so let, let me throw, throw back to Tom. I'm, I'm happy to, to talk around the issues of, of Java being made into free software. The thing that I want to underline for you is that it's, it is Sun's intent that Sun's implementation be released as free software, and that we create around it a community that is independent and that it's fully capable of driving that code in whichever direction it has to go. Um, we are happy as a company to be a peer member of that community rather than insisting on being the, uh, the, uh, the benign ruler of that community. And that's the direction that I'm intending that OpenJDK should go. Tom. So, with that, just to elaborate on what Simon had said, for the code that we don't have copyright for and we can't release into the GPL, we have these binary plugs that you can download 
today. Uh, if you go to openjdk.java.net, you have access to all of the source code and the instructions for how to build. Um, and so currently what will happen is you can, you can use uh, a alpha version of JDK 7 uh, to, to complete OpenJDK to have a fully functional runtime today. However, that fully functional runtime, of course, is not entirely um, free software, unfortunately. So this is really intended as a stopgap measure. And just to be clear, we really want to make OpenJDK 100% free software and 100% functional. And uh, when we do that, then we will no longer have to have these binary plugs. So what are these things? Well, there's, there's a color chooser, there's a font rasterizer, there's a color rasterizer, graphics rasterizer, there's a little bit of crypto code, and a few ancillary parts. Okay. Audio, yes. Audio. And so, um, one of the things that we've been hoping for and very excited about is working with uh, the ClassPath community because we're license compatible to see if it's possible to um, leverage some of that work and collaborate together. So in the past year, I've spent a lot of time with Mark Villard and meeting a number of the ClassPath people and talking about what they have. And so what basically has happened is the class path developers that have skills in these areas have offered their code for review for Sun Engineers. And so my, my role is to try and make sure that the Sun Engineers review that code um, as quickly as possible. So there's uh, a couple of other things that you need to know. In terms of infrastructure, we have the site today, which is openjdk.java.net. From that, you can get the source tarballs. We also have some mailing lists. One of the things that we do not have yet is a source code control repository. We've, Java is actually a very complex system comprising something like 6.5 million lines of code. And we have about 10 major integration points. So it's a distributed version control system. And unfortunately, right now, we're using a proprietary version control system. And so we wanted, when we open source Java, to use an open source version control system. And after a great deal of investigation, uh, the team has decided to, to choose Mercurial as that solution. So that happens to be uh, the version control system that OpenSolaris and other groups have, have decided to use also within Sun. And currently, I suspect that our, our timeline for, for publishing the Mercurial uh, repositories will be sometime later in the summer. I don't know exactly uh, when that will be. Um, we also, one of the other things that's fairly complex is we need to expose our bug tracker. We, we have um, currently a way of taking bugs over the web through the website, but that's, there's sort of an intermediate step to get into our internal bug tracker, and our internal bug tracker also cannot be exposed to the outside. So we're going to choose um, uh, an open source bug tracker and figure out how we can do the integration with all the back end tools that we integrate with the bug tracker within Sun. And uh, let's see, what else do I need to tell you? Oh, something that's very important is um, it's, Sun has a goal of making sure that our commercially licensed version of Java, the stuff that you've always been able to, to use from java.sun.com, is as close to identical to OpenJDK as possible. We have no interest in maintaining a proprietary version of Java that is somehow different or has secret sauce. We want to have um, effectively, as much as possible, the exact same code in both code bases. Um, however, as you can imagine, the only way that we can do that legally is if we hold copyright on all of the code that is in OpenJDK. So as we solicit uh, contributions for OpenJDK, we're asking developers to sign the Sun Contributor Agreement, which basically uh, is a non-exclusive copyright assignment to Sun for your contribution. And what that means is you get to keep full copyright rights to your code, and you give Sun the right to have copyright on your code so that, for example, if we were to choose to, at some later date to upgrade the license to GPL v3, we would have the right to do that. And it also gives us the right to uh, continue to publish our Java under the commercial license that we have now. So as far as Java, OpenJDK, now and in the future, 
at Java 1 this year, we announced an interim governance board that will be set up to handle issues within OpenJDK until such a time as we can hold open and fair elections to replace them with a, a permanent governance board. Um, the decision was to have uh, two, two members of the board from within inside Sun and two members of the board outside of Sun. I'm sorry, three at from outside Sun. I clearly haven't had my espresso yet. Um, the two inside Sun are Simon Phipps, who you see here, and also, also Mark Reinhold, who is the chief engineer for the Java SE platform. And on the outside of Sun, there are three people. One is Doug Lee, who is a researcher at the University of Oswego, who has done a lot of contributions to Hotspot, especially around concurrency. You may have heard his name. Another person is Fabiane Nardon, who is a, uh, lives in Sao Paulo. She is a Brazilian uh, uh, woman who is a CTO for a, a Java EE-related company and has been very active in uh, the Java Tools community and Java.net and also in the greater Java community in, in uh, South America. And the third outside member is none other than Dalbor Tavich, who is here, the leader of the CAFE community. And so with that, um, Dalbor, could you share with us your thoughts about the interim governance board and what you see happening in the next few months? Well, that's going to be quite interesting because we basically just started talking about those things. Um, Effectively, Java 1 was just one month ago when the whole thing was announced. And as you can imagine, the sound guys spent the last months just trying to get all of their source code up for the release. So after Java 1, basically, we could disappear for a week or two. I think Mark went on vacation and so on. Um, so, what the governance board, the interim governance board, is going to do is to just set up the constitution and, and a general framework things to happen, the elections to happen for the real governance board in the future. And it's um, terminated basically to be done with all that in the next year or so. Maybe. At, at next, the next maybe. So we should be done with each other one at least. I hope so. Um, it's kind of interesting because it's not, it's not the first time Sun is doing this whole thing. They've done the same thing with Solaris. They've also done this, this whole governance board procedure there. And, um, it's going to be interesting and really good to have Simon Phipps there, who was on interns for the Solaris community, uh, to see his experiences and to see how we can do things different, better. Or get it better this time. Get it better this time. Yeah. You never know. Um, and it's also interesting because the whole OpenJDK thing in its, in its breadth is different from Solaris in a way. Because coming from the classical community, I know we have a lot of different um, um, people to have a piece of it. There is the researchers, there is uh, uh, the regular runtimes, there is the head of time guys, there is you know, the spare time makers, there is the professional guys using this stuff. So um, within class, but in the last five or so years, we have managed to create a, a huge network of people who uh, work collaboratively without sharing always the same goals or working on the same project all the time. Um, just using the class library as the backbone of it. And uh, in a similar way, OpenJDK tries to attract both, say, projects just want to deliver a uh, Java runtime, but also academics and uh, even alternative implementations of Java, because they could all use the same class library. So by its design, it's going to have to be uh, tailored to suit a large community and just a project specific one. So that's going to be an interesting challenge to deal with in the governance there, which I hope we can deal with by being very liberal and not being very textual process oriented. So that's that. Um, I'm, I'm coming from the old Cathay Cluster thing, so we were the guys who used to kick sun in the nuts over the past couple of years, quite radically, until we fixed up stuff. And it was really interesting to see how. Uh, Getting to know people inside a company, changing conversations a bit, and uh, also change the flow of information. We can kind of see that they were trying hard in the last year to get things done, um, and we could work better, much, uh, much more effectively. Because Tom Marble was uh, communicating with Mark Miller and Tom Tromi all the time, um, and so when we, when Andrew Haley and the other guys set up ISD, which is uh, this 
experimental um, project around OpenJDK to make it work with Plasma as a substitute for the binary class. The people at Sun knew we were going to do that, and uh, we made sure that uh, everybody was going to have it. <coughs> well, let me, let me just without say hostility, without fear of 4K, all these very sensitive issues. Because one of the main challenges when, when, when we started talking about open source Java about four or five years ago, for real, in the Plasma community, was to overcome this huge fear of uh, forking in Java land, that the open source Java is going to break everything, it's going to be chaos, it's going to be drama, the end of the world. And it took a lot of effort on, on the Plasma side, to, and Debian side, and Fedora side, and so on, to make sure that people understand it. It's actually good for something, there is a need to package job applications that OpenOffice needs it, or, and so on. But, um, so, um, in that respect, it's, it's important when we do things like, like ISD that we walk a, a tight rope and try not to fall down with respect to the more conservative members of the Java community. Um, are kind of looking at, all, at this whole thing with a bit of a fear <laughs> in the face. I, I would love to hear about ICT. I don't know if well, open, let me just done. introduce Andrew for, yeah. in, in, before he says a word. And, that, and just to say that last year, as many of you know, we got Sun Java introduced into the non free archive under the DLJ license, which was, I think, a really great thing for Debian. Um, but we know, we knew, we know that getting into non-free is not nearly as effective as getting into main because in order for uh, many Java packages to really survive and thrive and to, in main, they must have all their build depends that are in main as well. And so to do that we had, you know, we knew that we needed Java to be open source. Um, and Fedora doesn't have the concept of non-free, so this wasn't even an issue, but one of the, one of the motivations for open sourcing Java was to make sure that we could get Java into the main repositories for Debian and Fedora. And, uh, and in fact, that's one of the reasons that I'm here, again, this, this time at DevCon, is I think that that's very, that's very important. And um, you have to understand that the Java development organization is very big at Sun, and there are a lot of processes that are changing as this culture of hundreds of developers change to open source. It's, socially a very complex thing to do. And one of the things that's complex is for them to appreciate the speed or the velocity of how you guys work in the open source world. One of the things that I think is great about the ISD project is using the full of freedoms of, under the GPL, it's possible to, as it, the ISD team has demonstrated that it's possible to actually bootstrap and build a portion of OpenJDK which is 100% GPL and does not have any binary plugs whatsoever. Um, and um, that, I think, is an amazing technical achievement. And that was also, a, you know, gets us on a path now where we can begin to uh, complete those plugs and then, I hope, eventually, get the solutions that we find in the ISP project <coughs> back into OpenJDK. And to say more about that, let me introduce Andrew Haley. Thanks. We've been using Java, uh, Red Hat now for, um, I suppose it goes back to around the turn of the 21st century, something like that. Um, and it all started with GCJ, uh, the Java ahead of time compiler. And I've been maintainer of that for many years now, I'm not sure how many. Um, we merged our library code base with that of ClassPath a few years ago, and that was a tremendous success. So. We had a reasonable implementation of the language in the library that was good enough for a lot of the stuff um, that we needed. So when some announced that they were going to open source Java, I was not particularly pleased to begin with because, well, it's must my job. Right? Um, <laughs> and also, if I'm completely honest, I didn't believe that. I was absolutely sure that Sun would release Java under some kind of brain damaged license that would be kind of semi free and just enough semi free that we couldn't actually use it and we couldn't actually link it with all the code uh, that we already had and there wouldn't be anything we could do in it anyway. So there were several meetings that we had in Red Hat and I said to everybody, I'll not forget it, it ain't going to happen, we just got to get on with our lives. 
GPL was rather a surprise to me. <laughs> <laughs> However, I'm still here. I haven't died of a heart attack. Um, when the OpenJDK was released with these binary plugs, I felt somewhat vindicated in my scepticism. Um, but we realized fairly quickly that although this was a great thing to have, we couldn't actually use it because there's no way we could ship these binary blokes as part of Fedora. Uh, so we were going to need to replace them as quickly as we could. Now, there's two things you can do. You can either take the approach of simply stubbing out things that you don't have, removing the calls, replacing dummy methods, and all of this kind of stuff. Or you can replace things with functional equivalent from free software. And we've actually done a combination of the two. Um, I don't think we have anything suitable to replace sound, uh, for example. And the graphics that we've actually got in the packed version at the moment is kind of semi there, but doesn't actually work. So you can't actually do much in the way of graphical applications. But the important thing about Ice-T, our alternative name for all of this in its current state, is that it's good enough to build itself in a reproducible way. So that each version of the IST can build the next version and so on. Um, we built it all to begin with using GCJ as the sort of bootstrap uh, Java runtime environment, which is uh, plenty good enough to do the very routine job of uh, rebuilding uh, JDK itself. And so now we're not quite sure what we're going to do. I think we're going to carry on improving the quality of ICT and making some of the replacements more functional and trying to work with some to get a completely open JDK by combining our code. Um, there's a few legal niceties to get sorted out as well to figure out who to figure out things like the contributor agreement and there is quite a substantial problem in that the class path code is owned by the Free Software Foundation and for some to integrate it in their code base it would have to be re-licensed to them. So there's lots of lawyer stuff going on the to try and figure it out. We really don't want to be in a position where we end up forking the thing with one lot of class path code and one lot of some code. So we're going to try and avoid that. Um, unfortunately, I can't really tell you about timescales when all of this is going to be ready. But I would personally be quite disappointed if uh, something uh, that's suitable and was reasonably functional wasn't in Fedora 8. Not that that will introduce anybody else here. <laughs> Interest anybody else here, of course, but that sort of time scale. What is the main brand? Well, end of the year ish, time scale, early next year. Uh, well, we, had, we did actually, we've just changed the contributor agreement that we're using for, uh, for open dedicated other some projects so that it is now possible for people who are the authors of FSF owned code. The FSF gives you a grant back of your of your copyright for you to to, to assign to others. So if it retains final ownership, it gives you the right to then grant it to others. And we've changed the contributor agreement so that if you have that grant back, we can share it with some. Uh, and that then means that, that there's lots of people who all who all own the copyright, and it means that no one has a has a problem of, of uh, being at a, a licensing dead end. Yeah, well, it, it ought to be possible to get something sorted out, but. Really, until it is all sorted out, the code that we're using to make ICT work isn't going to go back into Sam's code base, so it's just going to have to wait. And Mark will be working on those things, so he's talking with the best of us here at the set, so everybody. Yeah, maybe he's great with those things. He's, he's the perfect guy to talk to lawyers because he's very patient, he can deal with RMS, he can deal with paper. <laughs> <laughs> So that really gives you an overview of the state of the coffee cup. I, I should just, I'm, I'm, I'm pinging Gear Magnuson here as well, because I'm supposed to wave and say there is also another job, in the independent job implementation, at being done with Apache by Harmony. But unfortunately, I don't have a status update for you on that one. Is, is he in the Netherlands at the moment? I, I'm trying to find out. Oh, the other thing I should have said is that. Um, the status of the Java trademark is such that you can't be Java until you're complete and you've passed the uh, technical compatibility kit. And we're still working out how to make all of that work and uh, run the kit on OpenJDK so that the last 
the versions of Java that actually get shipped with free software can officially be called Java. We've been calling things GCJ and Classpack and things like that in the past simply because we weren't allowed to call them Java because we couldn't get our hands on the compatibility kit. And even if we had our Java, it wasn't really complete enough to pass it anyway. Um, we're hoping in a few years' time, a few months' time, a few days' time, even, who knows, uh, that we're going to get our hands on all of that stuff so we'll be able to actually have free Java bound TM. That would be that would be great, and that's our goal too, is to make sure that, that the implementations that are used by people can be branded Java compatible. That's it's it's very important for us. Um, and to give you an update for Debian, um, uh, as you know, Mandy Michael Cog has been working on uh, a meta package for Debian that includes all the build dependencies for IST. And um, one of the things that I hope that we can do with Mandy this week is uh, get an initial package for IST proposed. Uh, for uh, for Debian, so we can begin working on that in the Debian world as well. And uh, my one of my other agenda items for this week is I'm hoping to, um, in anticipation of Vice Team Open JDK uh, eventually going into Maine, I'd like to try and package as many cool applications as possible. The, the, I have really two targets for packaging. One is I want to package um, the refactor build dependencies for NetBeans and Glassfish because. As you may know, we even though those are open source projects, they tend to include a lot of dependent jars within them, and that really doesn't match very well with Debian policy, or Fedora policy for that matter. So we're going to try and refactor those things out and, and have separate packages for them that have interdependencies. And then uh, the other thing I'd like to do is um, to help Sam with his goal is uh, package up some sexy Java apps. And so if anyone is interested in collaborating, that would be really cool. Are there any? <laughs> <laughs> there is. I actually have a demo. I have I have a very low end um, Dell laptop, and I only support GLX 1.2. But if anyone supports GLX 1.3, I can show you uh, Wonderland, which is a 3D virtual world um, that currently is under a non-free license, but will very soon, I'm told, be uh, available under the GPL. Uh, which, if you want to think of it, it's basically a client and a server for a free version of Second Life, with the exception of Second Life, that in Second Life you design elements that you can never take out of the world. Here you'll have full control over the world. And the answer is yes, there's actually quite a lot of cool apps. <laughs> Let's use Java. Um, I, you know, we wrote it, so this may be special thing, but uh, NetBeans is a go. And uh, NetBeans is extremely cool. It's very responsive and fast, and uh, it's 100% it's Java. So, it's interesting actually looking at that and people not realizing that it's written in Java because it doesn't yeah. it, it, it doesn't suck. So. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of fools you for a bit and, and you do realize after a while. Like, hey. So, other questions? Uh, are there any plans to port the VM to, to more of the platforms? Oh, this is a great question. Thank you for asking. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so the question is, are there plans to port the VM to other platforms? And the answer is, yes, one of our goals with OpenJDK is ubiquity, and what that means is more operating system chip architecture combinations. And um, we actually haven't completely decided on the technique, but we have some code for new ports within Sun that we're hoping to release soon um, that will help the community get started on that on a, on a couple of specific ports. And as a result of doing that, we're going to define a policy for community-sponsored ports um, so that we can do that. And PowerPC is not surprisingly one of the most demanded. Linux PowerPC is one of the most demanded ports out there. It, it's actually worth um, reflecting for a little bit about the way that the Java world worked prior to now. Um, the, the way that Sun made a lot of its money from Java in the late 90s was by licensing the source code commercially to companies that wanted Java on their platforms. So the versions of Java that you see, for example, on Mac OS X are ones that Apple has licensed the source code from Sun and Apple has done the porting. And that means that it's actually Apple that owns the rights to that VM, not Sun. And having, just because Sun has made the, the source code free software, that doesn't mean that Apple's reworking of that code is able to be made free software as well. And so, I, uh, I couldn't comment on that. 
right, because I'm not supposed to identify any in any parties that I've had negotiations with. But I can to end that discussion and have a different one on general terms. Um, I've spoken to quite a lot of people about uh, their work on the Java platform, whether we're to relicense things that are proprietary that stem from our code, and generally the answer has been no. Mm -hmm. However, I think that there is there's some interesting observations to make about Mac OS X. One of them is that they use the GNU tool chain to build Mac OS X. And I think that Apple is um, very interested in Java and uh, has uh, very interested in having an up-to-date version of Java. So it'll be an interesting, interesting uh, discussion, interesting particular work to watch. But, but I mean, the thing that's worth reflecting on, as you see each of these things, you know, people say, why isn't the version of Java on AIX free software? Now you have GPL'd it. Why haven't you GPL'd the version on AIX? Well, we don't own the version of Java on AIX. It's based on our source code, so it wouldn't be a big deal to, to for it for the diff to be made GPL, so that you could then build it from the version that is in the Open JDK community. But IBM owns the version that's on on AIX. Apple owns the version that's on, on for PowerPC that's on iOS 10. IBM owns the version for PowerPC if there is one. I think they've, they've got a PowerPC version that they use. So um, the answer to all of these questions is um, because of the way the Java was licensed in the late 90s. Um, it, 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 it's, <laughs> it's fascinating with the forking discussion. Java is already forked all over the place. Fortunately, they're all compatible forks. And so it turns out that Java is the same thing in most places to within a degree of, well, to, to within a margin of error. And uh, a, a helpful discussion to have with proprietary companies is if you see you have Java over there, we know that it's based on Sun's code. Why don't you make it free software? And uh, I can have that conversation directly with companies, but if you have contact with them as well, it's good for you to have that conversation, because ultimately I don't get to vote as to whether IBM makes its implementation or Apple makes its implementation free software. Now, if they start, if these companies start using the GPL version, doesn't the viral nature kind of force them to have to either I, 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 accept it? Again, I'm well trained not to use the V word, but yes. Okay. So basically, <laughs> I, I like to, when, I, when they talk about this, I like to, to smile on my face. When they talk about the copula property of the GPL. Yeah. It's a good thing. But the, 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 that's the reason why, so you know, one of the questions that's been asked about the governance for OpenJDK is why aren't any of the big corporations on the governance board? And the answer is because none of the big corporations are in the OpenJDK community either. That makes me think of Gear. Is he online? I, 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 I pinged him, but he hasn't said Actually, my connection's gone down. So, are you saying that basically Apple, if they start using your GPL version, they're going to be forced to give away yeah. their their chips? So they they would be, but the we will continue to make the code available under the existing licenses that all the licensees have got it. So, uh, so, so they have a back door. They, so they, they have, don't need to. They have a back door if they need to. They don't have to jump to it. Now, we would much rather everyone move to the JK community because it's, it actually reduces our costs for that to happen. And it also means that the other companies get uh, much faster access to innovation. So, so it seems to be in their interest. But there's lots of companies out there that seem to think the GPL is bad for them. So can't, what about if you just disabled yeah. allowing them to license it or anything but the GPL? Well, the difficulty... That would be more. The, 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 there's two difficulties with that. First of all, it would result in us going, going, you know, asses going straight to court. Mm -hmm. And uh, because we already have existing contractual arrangements mm -hmm. that don't run out for quite a long time. And secondly, it would uh, mean that Java, so there's a huge opportunity here. There's an MSU that just did the evangelism bit. There's a huge opportunity here for um, the free software uh, community to leverage other platforms without having to get their hands dirty. Because Java actually is everywhere. I mean, it's on, it's on cell phones, it's on OS X, it's on mainframes, it's on old AS 400s, it's on Windows, and we, we go to a lot of effort to make sure it shows up on Windows. And that means that it's actually possible to write free software that, that you are doing within the context of Debian, and yet for it to have a user base that extends way beyond Debian and acts as a funnel, dra dragging people back to the place where it's really designed for. Um, I think there's a, an, an incredible opportunity for us as a free software community to begin to influence people who've not been able to reach before for just simple mechanical practical reasons, which were that they wouldn't switch to Linux. And uh, so they therefore won't end up to any other arguments either, thank you. I think we've got an incredible opportunity to begin to let tendrils go out into platforms that we have previously had no influence over through the Java platform. And so because of that, I'm actually quite keen not to go piss off Apple just yet. 
because I think it's really good for it to be possible to write an app that is just intended for Debian but turns out to be usable on Apple. And but the people who want to read about its status and its update find themselves coming to Debian to do so. Um, I think that creating that that final thing is, is really powerful for us as a free software community. So I don't really want to cut them off just yet. And I can't because they they take my ass in the court. And the thing is, um, since Java has been commercially approved for all these vendors for more than 10 years, I guess, those business models have evolved very, very slowly. So all of a sudden you have this new way of doing things. It's just a new opportunity which they can take or but they don't have to. If you look at GCC, in general it seems to make sense for chipset vendors to actually work on improving the performance of the thing on their chipsets and so on. So, it's hard to predict what the future will bring. There are different models where, where those chipset or others just come to figure out what their optimal thing is. I mean, some people don't want to continue competing with their proprietary versions because they have proprietary enterprise servers where a 5% performance increase brings them $10 million dollars in the conflicts. I don't know. Some other people may just say, well, we're making chips, you know, we want Java to be faster than chips. So, that, that reminds me, I, I heard uh, Sam mention his talk this morning about RML as an architecture. I'm not familiar with that. Can somebody tell me what that is? Are you about it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's just that ARM um, changed the API for uh, the architecture ARM um, because, well, the old API was all right, but it had the fundamental flaws of the team you had an FPU. The fact that there had been two objects with an FPU and about 100 without. So uh, there was appalling inefficiency. If you ever actually tried to execute any FP instructions, obviously you try to avoid that. But, um, and you couldn't mix, you could compile things efficiently with GCC using emulation instead of uh, an instruction port for every failed FPU instruction. But there was an enormous overhead to that. You can't mix the two sorts of code, they're just incompatible. So the new API lets you mix the old and new, uh, well, with FP code and emulating FP code on the same uh, stuff, so it's better. And there's various other things which are better, like we don't have a floating point um, double representation, which is different from everybody else in the whole world, uh, which is actually from a whole load of bugs. Um, <laughs> so it's just a better API, really. And we changed the kernel API at the same time, because since it was designed, ARM um, changed from being a separate, a combined um, page instruction set to a separate one. Uh, cache, sorry, cache is working on and they have separate ones going around. So, so what would the query users be for ARM? So the, the point is that unless you have a very old ARM chip, ARM EL will work just exactly the same as old ARM did, but then faster. And you can now choose to use FP stuff if your CPU has some support for it. So it's basically it's for it's okay. Except for at the moment it doesn't support the four instruction set, which is what's used on strong ARM chips. There's still a lot of strong ARM chips out there. And we can theoretically support that, but we haven't done it yet. Um, so until we do, old ARM's going to hang around supporting them. Just thinking for a moment about... But yeah, that, this is what I'm is the, the thing. Um, so what is the status of Java ARM, which is only why I came here to find out if anything happened. Um, if you don't have a port and you'd like someone to do one, it's basically go around. <laughs> <laughs> Good That's kind of a leading question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not. Yeah, are you? I'm not aware that we have a. a, a the sun has a ball. What's ball? We've 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 done them in the past. I don't know the status of the code, but um, that's something I will look into. Please, you know, contact me and, and yeah, I'll. I'll it has to be works. And you said, uh, yeah. Um, if we don't, if we don't, um, we need one, clearly. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, Andrew? Uh, just a little point on that subject. Once Java is free, it enables the community to do fast ports, perhaps at the same time as doing GCC. Um, I'm pretty sure that we first um, uh, Java compiler and runtime to be shipped working on the Titanium, for example, was GCJ, because we did it, um, we being the GCC2, including me. 
did it before any of the chips were actually available, and we got it out of the door uh, very, very early in the day. Um, as soon as I believe Linux was willing at all on Itanium, uh, the GCJ port was available. And actually having open JDK ought to enable that uh, for any new chips that people are wanting Linux to, they should have something running, the Java implementation using the open JDK out of the box on day one, rather than having to wait, in some cases, I, maybe a year or two before the official Java port was made available. One of, the, one of the pieces of code that Gary Benson is looking for is for us to, to release is the a really old and now out of date uh, IA64 port, but it has a C++ JIT that would be really helpful for um, for bootstrapping new ports. So that's one of the pieces of code that would, would help in the porting effort as soon as we can liberate it. I mean, you might talk about ports like that as being uh, entering, but if there isn't enough community will to write a full hotspot port, then it doesn't get done, but who cares? You know, you've got Java working, it's not super fast, but it's going to be good enough for an awful lot of things that people need to do, and it's going to be tested, it's going to be official, it's going to be compatible. We should see a compatible jam again. Yeah, yeah. We should see a little bit of it again. It's fast enough to do jam if you throw it. Yeah. Unless it's a heavy still application. Yeah. What is the issue with porting at all? I assume that the base publication is written in C or C++ and just needs to recompile. Well, you'll be pleased to find that in the infinite wisdom of the Java development team, Java is actually a build depends for Java. <laughs> and that makes porting a challenge. Mm -hmm. GCJ to the rescue, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's that, actually, that's literally how XT does it, is GCJ comes to the rescue. Um, the way that, 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 you know, I actually tried to do one of these, I did get it super far, but the way that the way that you start is with NFS tricks, where at the certain points of the build process, if you, when you need the JVM, you do that on a machine that has one, and just do that on an NFS file system such that, you know, the right bits end up in the right place, and you switch back to the native target. Um, so porting is kind of ugly the first time around. Um, but this is, I think, going to be only tricky for this period of time because at the point that we get, you know, we can use GCJ and we can use IST, um, and then if we, especially if we get this new, this new C++ JIP, um, porting should be substantially easier. GCJ is still somewhat bust on arm. It kind of nearly works now. Oh, you know what? I will tell you why it's bust on our fleet, yes. right? There are some patches, right, that are in the Debian deck, and nobody has ever submitted them upstream to me. Uh, They've been in there for years, mm -hmm. and they will not submit these patches to me so I can put them in upstream. Like, maybe we should just sit there and do it then. Yeah, maybe somebody should. Lock the doors. Is it pure inside of the whole up, or is it just that nobody's done the effort to integrate into the current mainstream? Nobody has ever explained it to me. I've been very tempted to uh, simply apply them myself, but they are too substantial for me to do without copyright assignment. So I can't touch them until somebody decides who the hell wrote these patches for Debian in the first place. Yeah, and if you can actually find out who it is. I've seen the pictures of it's being filled on Dell, he needs a copyright statement, so that should be alright. Well, okay, okay, so let's go. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That's probably all it's got. And then, and then it's 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 just had a quick question on, on a different topic, maybe. Um, the current um, Sun GRE uh, in the UK uh, depends on the Lucida font. What are the plans in terms of the Open GDK uh, release in terms of fonts? Well, this is a kind of more of a general problem, which is um, Java. <coughs> one of the challenges with Java is that it, and Linux is that it doesn't use system libraries for things. For example, fonts, um, time zone database, are two kind of painful examples. And uh, the reason is that you know Java's promise is that it works the same everywhere, and so classically, instead of we, you know, the Java mentality has not been to depend on the platform to provide 
things in a consistent way. They're all it's sort of like set up and linked. Okay, well, well there are open fonts that you can ship in on all the platforms. Well, the I think it, yeah, I think that that's. In fact, I'm pretty sure that in OpenJDK we already have some open fonts so that replace that. Or I know that no, that was discussed. The name of it's something that's already been uh, thought out in the OpenJDK community. Yes. Yeah. But if you have cache around fonts, you can definitely yeah. use it. But it, I mean, there's just the same potential. It, it, the, the issue here is that to create consistency, you either have to uh, implement it inside the JRE, or you have to implement a load of code inside the JRE that fixes the different ways it's implemented on all the platforms. And the path of least resistance was to implement it in the JRE. And that's why there is a time zone database. That's why Java had a problem when the US decided to arbitrarily change its, <laughs> it, it, when summertime started this year. It was because, well, Java had, had a time zone database that knew when summertime started. And it was wrong. And it was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, the, it, it's a pretty intractable problem, actually, because you, you know, every platform does do, just, uh, calls time zones different things treat them differently, has the database in a different format. And either you have to have you know, hundreds of thousands of lines of code to fix it so, that, so it looks the same while every platform is different, or you implement a database and then risk it being different from everybody else's. Uh, I don't think anyone has come up with a really elegant solution to that. So, so the, that's the, 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 the technical lucid. problem with, the, with the rendering uh, subsystem, but the fonts itself. Uh, but the, the, the Lucida font, I think, was picked a long time ago before yeah. anyone had, had even was aware that there was the potential of a free font problem. And it's it, and the, the, the difficulty with this, there's lots of things, is it is, it is. and making it other is actually um, mm -hmm. non-trivial in all the places that are not Debian. But I guess in, to, to make it to me, you would have to depend on a free <laughs> yes. Well, so, but, but anyway, the, the fault problem is on, on his radar. Okay, great. His, <laughs> yeah. his pay next year depends on solving it. So. <laughs> I got a comment specifically about the Debian Java packages, the ones that you mentioned earlier, which uh, went in on free. I've got to say, it was a, a bittersweet day for me when I saw it go in. Sweet because, sweet, we got Java finally. Um, bitter because I had to read the package uh, licensing on install. Uh, yes. And that was forced. Yes. Uh, and I have. Hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of servers. We've um, already planned for this. Yeah, I need to get rid of that, and it was specifically in that packet package that I couldn't get rid of. It. Well, that's why I'm preseasoning us for it. That's what. Well, that's why. The why closest we, thing didn't support it. It was a, you had to read this. for us. Yeah. But maybe we're doing something. Worse. No, that's exactly that's exactly. I mean, that's exactly why we had used DevConf is so that we could preseason. Yeah, exactly for that case. It should work. I mean, we're we're installing it on those servers the same way. Okay. Yeah. It just seems to me to be very brain dead that if you're trying to do a mass installation. Of course, we knew yeah. that. We knew but that. That's it, why it, it was designed. It, it was designed to use DevConf, so that right. So, so you, you, the organisation could have sent once and then and then use DevConf. Yeah. Okay, I'll go back to it. I, I well, clearly I haven't documented that very well. <clears throat> Hopefully, it's only a short time. Hopefully, it's still going to be like absolutely. Yeah. Then you can move to. I, I just wondered um, what the relationship on going into like it's been between uh, GCJ and uh, Sun's Java. Let's ask Andrew. Andrew. Yeah. Andrew. Andrew. Well, um, where's, where's GCJ going? Will it? Will this? Will this not GCJ on the head? Will this GCJ GCJ go from strength to strength as a result? Um, There's a great deal to, to begin with. I didn't know what to do, and I sort of still don't really. There's the layer between the Java virtual machine and the Java runtime isn't actually defining the specification anyway. So, well, it may be the sum of the but not one that I've ever had a chance to look at. So, it'd be very tempting to say, why don't you use GCJ? We'll simply take all of Sun's class libraries and just drop them in, right? Unfortunately, this would have more or less exactly the same effect as, say, picking up a Tokyo telephone exchange and dropping it in the middle of New York. It would result in something completely more functional. So, I don't actually know. I know there are some people using GCJ in some particular application areas for which it's particularly well suited. So, I'm hoping that it will keep going there. Whether or not it will keep going on the Linux desktop. I don't actually know. That really is up to all the users. It's sort of out of my hands. I mean, if people wanted to keep going, then they well. Uh, 
Um, there is the obvious question of my time and the time of other people at Red Hat and how much time will Red Hat be prepared to keep, you know, spending money on people to keep it going. I don't really know about that. We haven't really decided because we don't know what the brave new world of free Java is going to look like. And to be honest with you, we're not going to know what it's going to look like until we've actually started shipping this entire free version of OpenJDK in Fedora and Debian and all the rest of it. And then we'll take another look and take stock and see how much interest there is in keeping GCJ going. A synthesis of some of the best qualities of GCJ and some of the best qualities of OpenJDK and some of Java. The synthesis is potentially very good. Very slick integration with GCC system compilers, C++ <coughs> sort of thing, which GCJ does very well. You know, you can use normal debuggers and stuff. You don't need to do Java debuggers. You can use system profiling tools. There's so many things that GCJ does very, very well. But it doesn't have the ultimate uh, speed that Hotspot has with all of its magic runtime in line and stuff like that. Is it possible to create an interesting technique? synthesis of these two approaches. Yeah, absolutely. Is there enough time on this to do it? Don't know. Thank you. Well, we're getting towards the end. Uh, are there any, any final questions? Maybe just a quick comment. Then. Sure. Um, <laughs> so I work uh, with uh, uh, grid systems and we do health research. And, uh, I'm just going to echo the, the big thank you for making <laughs> Jana actually come up in, in non free because it's it was originally a, a pain to have to pull it in manually on all these uh, nodes and accept the license and redo the Java home path and all that. So it's great when it's in there. So e eagerly waiting for the open GDK version of so all the, sure. like the next generation. For, for those of you who are stuff. doing you know preceding or big big installations, I'd love to talk to you later and get get the full story because that really fascinates me. I'd, I'd love to hear what you're doing. I'm going to be here all week. I'll be here for uh, well for another week. So. Um, if the, uh, I say this every time I do a talk, but if we do something really stupid at some, I, I would much prefer that the first time I hear about it is by send, you sending an email to ombudsman at sun com rather than by reading about it somewhere else. I'm happy for the second place you say it to somewhere else, but I'd really like it if the first place that you say it is to ombudsman at sun com. Because that way I stand a snowball's chance in hell of getting it fixed before it becomes an issue. Um, so ombudsmanson.com is, is your friend and is there to help you. Uh, on the other end of ombudsmanson.com is a member of my staff whose job it is to read the email, work out if it's confidential, yeah, and if it is, anonymize it, and find someone in Sun to act as the advocate for that problem. And that person inside Sun then behaves as if they had your problem, as far as all the rest of the company is concerned, so that no one knows whose problem it is and why it's important. You know, there's no, there is no concept of retribution, if there's any concept of such a thing. And so that there is actually an active advocate inside the company for it. Uh, I don't promise that we'll get everything that goes to ombudsman.com solved the way you would like it to be solved, but I guarantee everything will get a reply and will be considered fairly. And general, Not that Sun does anything stupid. Oh, very good thought. Great, well thanks a lot for coming.